So we're going to just do a study of Revelation chapter 5, starting at verse 1, and we'll be looking at cross-references, word studies. This might be quite detailed as we go through this. So we'll just start reading. I think I'll start off just by reading the first five verses. So Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Okay, we're just going to go through this verse by verse at first. But even from the first verse, we're going to have to go to cross-references and words that come up. So let's go back to verse 1. It says, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Now, I'm reading the New King James Version, and I actually like the King James Version better and other translations, because they say... I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book, a book, because the Greek word for this scroll is biblios. That is the word we get the Bible from, a book. Literally, that's what the word Bible means. It's a, a book. So we're not talking about a book. We're talking about the book. And right off the top here, I'm going to have to emphasize something. Because of other studies that I've done, I'm convinced that this book is not another book outside the Bible. It's not an extra biblical book. This book is actually the Word of God that is sealed. Now that is true today. Many people try to read the Bible. And without guidance, you see, they already have a carnal attitude toward the book. When they try to open it, it's a sealed book to them. I can't understand it. So I'm going to emphasize that part, that the book is actually the Word of God. The Word of God has seven seals upon it. As we open these seven seals, the Word of God is coming to pass again and again. The reason I know this is because when I've studied words, I love word studies. So we'll just go back. First of all, it's a book, and it's written on the inside and the outside, meaning like a scroll. Now, this wasn't typical. It's, it's important to mention that because most scrolls are written on one side of the scroll. This one is written inside and on the back side. This same idea of a book comes up in Revelation chapter 10. I want you to notice that certain things repeat themselves in the book of Revelation. All of a sudden, we're in chapter 10, and we were just in chapter 5. Why? Because the words are important. The words that we read in Revelation 5 also come up in Revelation 10. Verse 2, talking about a mighty angel, said, He had a little book open in his hand. Go down to verse 9, and it says, so I went to the angel, and I said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it. 
and it will make your stomach bitter, and it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. So the little book, or the book that is written inside and out, is showing up again in Revelation 10. And again, out of this book, he says, you must prophesy The reason I believe that this is the Word of God, it's not a new book, it's not another book. It is the Word of God, because the Word of God is always what the prophets prophesied. So in Revelation 10, you noticed that he ate the book, and it tasted like honey. Now there's a connection here. If you go way back into the Old Testament... Remember the manna from heaven? Do you remember what it tasted like? Like honey, it was sweet. Honey wafers. Mm -hmm. Same idea. The word of God to us is sweet. It's wonderful. It's delicious. But we also know that as we fill ourselves with the word of God, it becomes alive. And because it helps us grow spiritually, we begin to discern false things around us because the Word of God is true. And it challenges all the things that are false. So what we've read here in Revelation 5, it's a scroll written within and without. Revelation 10, it's a little book. You eat it, and it's sweet like honey, but bitter to the stomach. Now we're going to go way back to Ezekiel. So Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9, Now when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. And he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and the outside. Written on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. Guys, do you see what we just did? What I've always said over and over again, there is nothing new in the book of Revelation. You're actually reading the book of Ezekiel, and the same imagery is being used. A scroll that is written inside and outside. We'll see more as we read Ezekiel. Let's go to the next chapter. Ezekiel chapter 3. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. Do you see the same language as we're reading in Revelation 5 and Revelation 10? So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that I give you. So I ate and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. Do you see the same idea? The word of God to us is honey. Now, you could actually go off on a little study right here and study the word honey and how that word honey is associated with the word of God. Even in the life of Christ when he was a young child, Remember discernment that Isaiah was saying? The young child will learn discernment. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that even Jesus, when associating himself with the word of God, the word of God is like honey. It's sweet to us. Satisfying. Delicious. But also, we read in the book of Revelation, but it was bitterness in my stomach. And you may think, okay, Is that in Ezekiel as well? Yes, it is. If we follow the language, now it doesn't show up right away. Stay in Ezekiel chapter 3, go all the way down to verse 14. So the Spirit lifted me up 
and took me away, and I went in bitterness. Do you see it? Same language. Bitterness in the heat of my spirit. Now, guys, can I demonstrate this to you emotionally? A while ago, we were in a session where I was preaching, and you guys were getting stirred up. And Lori said that God would spew them out of his mouth because they're the lukewarm things that they are. Do you remember how you felt when you say, said those words? Yeah. Got to pick a side. Right. We can't sit on the fence and go, oh, well, maybe, maybe. And you were a little bit angry, too, right? Yeah. Now, can you relate to this where he says, I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit. Mm -hmm. Hot. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to emotionalize the spirit of God, mm -hmm. but I want us to grow up to know that there is sometimes our feelings are affected. Our feelings are not the source of the Spirit, but the Spirit of God affects us. It's like me when I'm listening to the book of Revelation or I'm listening to the prophetic books. I do it all the time. I play audio when I'm traveling. This description in Ezekiel chapter 3 is a description that I often feel myself when I'm listening to the Word of God. It's thrilling to me, and yet at the same time, it's hard to describe this. There's a joy in me because the Word of God is alive as I'm listening to it, but there's also bitterness in my spirit because I know I have to correct. And that part is no fun. You eat the Word of God, it's like honey, but yet it's bitter to your tummy. And we're not talking about your physical stomach. We're talking about how you feel inside. Today, I was listening to someone teach Revelation 9. Out of the smoke, the locusts come. And you know that all that teaching from way back in the 70s from Hal Lindsey that the locusts are helicopters? Oh my goodness, it's still around. <laughs> you know what it is now? Apache helicopters. It's just ridiculous. And people are preaching this, interpreting the Word of God as they're reading it this way. It, I'm telling you, there's something that just rises up in you and you want to scream. That's what I mean by you eat the word of God and there's something in you that just, oh, can you just stop being so carnal? You are deceiving people with your carnal teachings. Heat in your spirit because you're taking in the word of God. I noticed the same language from our subscribers. You know, they'll talk about Diotrephes, who refused to allow John the Apostle to come to his church and teach. And how the subscribers will say, yeah, that's just like today. Now listen, guys, uh, we're using language out of the prophets that the language sounds exactly like what you're reading in Revelation. But I want you to stop and think about all the prophets for a second. Isaiah, right? What motivates him to go preach? He saw the Lord. He saw the Lord in all of his glory, high and lifted up. He saw the glory of God, and he went and corrected the people. Why? Because they've got a false concept of God. You see, Isaiah the prophet actually has to see God as he is in all of his glory to go challenge the false. The glory always represents light. So the word of God to you is light. Now what do we have to do? You can't put it under a bushel like Jesus taught. 
Now you have to go and confront the darkness. Yeah, because when you bring the light forth, it exposes the darkness. Yep. Nothing's hidden. Mm -hmm. Okay. Think of all the prophets. They had the same experiences. Jeremiah, what do you see? I see the rod of an almond tree, and we've explained this before. This represents watching over. And God says, I will watch over my word to perform it. Now, what I'm trying to do is show you that all the prophets were given the word of God. So when we get to the book of Revelation, we're not going to take this book and say it's a mysterious book that is extra biblical. We've got to get this through our heads. What we're reading in the book of Revelation absolutely relates to all the prophets. It's a summary of the entire book. It's a summary. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. We could also say it's a conclusion. Mm -hmm. Let's wrap it up, you see. The book wraps everything up. It's, it's all unfolded before. So we're going to go back to Revelation 5. Now verse 2. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? Now Mark and I were talking about this. Why does it say a strong angel? I'm going to confront a false teaching right here. All the flaky people out there will talk about angels. Oh my goodness. It's the talk of the town in the church, and it's the talk of the town amongst people that call themselves spiritual. Okay, they'll talk about angels. Because of language like this, strong angel, they will actually describe as an angel, and in their mind, they're going to describe a strong angel. So in their mind, it's going to be a carnal picture. What's a strong angel? A really huge angel. No, a strong angel doesn't mean a gigantic angel. A strong angel is an angel that knows who can open the book. That's what makes him strong. As we've shown you before, in the book of Revelation, the angels that interact with John have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's what makes them strong. All this flaky teaching about angels, people see angels all the time, or they claim to see angels. It's always this monstrous being. They're strong because they're declaring the testimony of Jesus Christ. This angel is just about to open his mouth, and he says, Who is worthy? And he tells you, Do not weep, in verse 5. Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and loose its seals. Listen, this is something I understand. That's why this book here is not a mysterious book, because I know that the revelation of Christ has opened the rest of the Bible to me. And to you, that's your testimony. That's what you hung on to. You knew carnal teaching when you heard it, because you're thinking, no, that's not opening up the book. No, that's just bringing more confusion. Yeah. You heard all that teaching. It's not opening the book up. But the revelation of Christ, understanding who God is through his Son, opens up this whole book. Because the whole Bible is opened by Christ. Now, what I mean by open is, let's use Jeremiah again as a good example. You read the book of Jeremiah, right? And you say to yourself, well, these preachers here in the book of Jeremiah are really in trouble. Then in your heart you say, the preachers today are really in trouble. Why? Because you understand the Word of God is yesterday, today, and forever. This book, the book of Revelation, is the same. It was, 
It is, and it is to come. It's hard on our brains. We've been taught by other preachers and teachers in the church that this book is to come. We can't see it as was and is. But Jesus is the one unfolding this revelation to John. That's why we have to understand this. The book was true, is true, and will be true in the future. It's actually been unfolding through time. See, most of the church is waiting for this book to come to pass. No, oh, it's been coming to pass every day since it was written. Jesus opening the seals of the book, and the book is the Bible. The book is the Word of God. If we see that he's been opening the book through all time, to the people with the right heart. You have to include the disciples, the apostles, the believers in the early church. That book, the seals were being taken off that book. Now, in order to demonstrate this, we're going to go to Paul's teachings. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul was talking about the glory of God that Moses saw. Remember? God had Moses go up on the mountain. If you remember the story, he went up on the mountain, and there was a cloud on that mountain. So he went up, and he came down with the tablets, the law written on the tablets, the word of God written in stone upon the rock, that came out of the mountain, which is a picture of Christ. Daniel chapter 2. The rock was cut out of the mountain. Some of this picture language people can't follow, but you can follow it. Now, as Moses came down, he realized that because he had been spending time in the presence of God, and he had asked God, show me your glory. Now, the glory was not a physical appearance. The glory was God opening his mouth and declaring to Moses who he was. Now, when Moses came down from that mountain, his face was shining. And so what he did, he didn't want to go talk to the people distracted by his face shining, so he put a veil over his face. Now, Paul then uses that language. You thinking to yourself, here again, Paul is looking into the Old Testament and he can see Christ in that event. We can't. We need Paul to explain this to us so we too can see Christ in that story of Moses going up and coming down with the glory shining on his face. He puts a veil over it. Now, Paul then describes this to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. He says, Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end or the result of what was passing away. In other words, in Moses' physical appearance, that shining would have passed away. But while he addressed the people, he was fresh from the mountain. The glory of God was shining. This is a picture of Christ. So he said, he put a veil over his face. Then Paul uses that analogy. See, it's a real event. And he's using it as, it as a prophetic analogy to reveal Christ. He says this, For their minds were blinded to this very day, 
the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. Now, you're thinking, Paul, how did you see that? Because he understood the glory of God was the spoken word. The glory of God for us is the spoken word manifest in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 1.3, once again. God has spoken in time past to us by the prophets. He's spoken unto us through Jesus Christ. The express image of his glory. It's not a physical light. Jesus didn't go walking around shining like a neon lamp. In fact, the glory was veiled in flesh. Yeah, yeah. Just like Moses wearing a veil over his face, the glory was veiled in flesh. You didn't see that glory or understand that glory until Jesus opened his mouth and declared the truth about his Father. There was the glory. No man has seen God at any time, but his Son has declared him. No man has seen the glory of God. But Jesus, full of the glory of God, proclaimed the glory of God. And now you understand why he came to us. And he said, now you go and you preach the gospel. Because the glory cannot manifest like the flaky charismatics claim. It's not going to show up in a meeting. You're walking around in vessels of flesh proclaiming the Word of God, which reveals the glory of God. Now, the glory that came on Jesus were the words that he spoke. The Word of God is the glory of God. Now, if all of that is true, and we're reading in Revelation chapter 5, the book has seals on it. It's the same idea as the veil. You've got the book, but you can't see the glory. And without the glory, you can't challenge the darkness, the false. The same idea in the book of Revelation. Jesus is the only one that can open that book to you. And it seems to us like he's releasing it one seal at a time. Because that's how we grow. Line upon line. It's seal upon seal being opened. By who? I didn't open it. Mm -hmm. Jesus opens the seals. He's the only one worthy. So it's the same idea. Seal upon seal is open to us. But when you get back into the book of Isaiah, in chapter 28, remember it's line upon line, just like you said. Precept upon precept. I could use other words that are not written in the book of Isaiah, but it's the same idea. Glory upon glory. Did Paul tell you that? He said, from glory to glory. From revelation to revelation. From understanding the words to more understanding of the words. That's how it works. As these seals open, most of you have read the book of Revelation, you know that judgments come from these seals. Well, listen, you can't judge or discern without the revelation of Christ. First of all, you have to have that foundation. You have to know the glory of God that was revealed in Christ. That's the true glory of God. Then you can challenge the false. What do these seals do as they're opened up? They confront flesh. They destroy. There's certain things in the language we don't like. We've always been told by the Christian church, we need to be nice and kind. Until you don't need to be nice and kind anymore. 
I try that with every person that tries to argue with me. I'm nice and kind at the first, at the beginning of my conversation with them. Right? But they argue and argue and argue. And I'm not going to go back and forth 20 times trying to argue someone into revelation. No one has ever been argued into understanding God through Jesus Christ. You can't argue them in. So I start off nice. The arguments reveal the stubbornness in them. In the end, you have to just open up the Word of God and say, Listen, you are Antichrist. You're carnal. You despise the revelation of Christ. You believe in a God that is unlike Christ. Yeah, the heart reveals the true foundation on which they're built. Yeah. You're going to respect the teachings of men? I don't, because I believe in the revelation of Jesus Christ. That glory exposes the dark teachings of flesh. See, the thing is, we're reading the book of Revelation that is unfolding a time when Christians need to read the Word of God and have it open up to them. Not only is it liberty like honey to us, it's wonderful, but it also is bitterness because now we have to prophesy it. And that's not just the job for the prophets, one or two here and there. That's for all believers to be prophetic. That's what Acts chapter 2 is all about, all of the believers. Ever been in a situation where you didn't want to tell someone the truth? until you knew that you had to tell them the truth. Was there that release? Oh, sure. When you said, no, I'm just going to tell them the truth. You're hesitating, and the reason you have a knot in your stomach is because, am I going to cater to these people and just lie to them and make them feel good? Or should I tell them the truth? Because it would feel a lot better for me if I could just tell them the truth. Even if they hate me and kick me out, I will feel better. Okay, I'm going to try to wrap this up by jumping from 2 Corinthians 3 back into Revelation, okay? Here's the idea. The seals are being opened. The Word of God is being opened up. The same idea is what Paul is talking about. The veil... There's a veil over the hearts of people when they read the Old Testament because they can't see God as he really is. You need Christ to see God as he really is. Then he says in verse 16 of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. See, he said that. In verse 14, because the veil is taken away in Christ. Now, guys, let's go back to Revelation chapter 5. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll? Who is worthy to open the book and loose its seals? To reveal the book. Verse 5, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and loose its seven seals. These judgments that are going to come out of these seven seals being opened is not something new. It is the word of God being opened up to us again, just like it was opened to the apostles, and just like the book was opened and given to the prophets, the word of God came into their hearts, and they prophesied the word of God. I think I'll end it there.